Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, on behalf of Universal Museum Joanneum, it's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to your conference, Life of Crops Towards an Investigative Memorialization. Uh, this conference is, as you all will know, the basis of a collaborative cross-disciplinary project established by the artist Milica Tomic that considers memorialization as a living investigative process. And as you can see, it brings together experts from the various fields of research. And I guess I don't have to tell this audience uh, the importance of memorialization, uh, especially in the case of the remembrance of the Holocaust. The special focus of Milita Zomitz is laid on the concentration camp of Aflens in southern Styria, which was one of the many subcamps of the, that were part of the concentration camp of Mauthausen, whose main focus was to exploit and to extinct its inmates by forced labor, also as a part of the economic system of the SS within the Nazi regime. And one of the main ideas of Militza Tomic, as you will discuss later on, is of course that history inscribes itself into the soil and that it leaves its traces in the soil. And therefore it's a lucky coincidence that at the same time we show a temporary exhibition, uh, the earth's thin skin about the soil, the life, the function of the soil, the waste, the exploitation of the soil in our Natural History Museum here in the Ioneum Quarter. And of course, you are all welcome to visit this um, exhibition during one of your breaks in the conference. I'd also like to thank all our partners. I guess Elisabeth Fiedler will then mention them separately. Uh, let me just uh, stress the Technical University of Graz as one of, of our um, collaborative partners here because this is the place, this place, really this place, uh, Joanneum Quarter, Raubergasse, is the place where in 1811 the Joanneum was found by the Habsburg Archduke Johann as a unique combination of a museum on the one hand to create national identity and a technical college on the other hand, so it were the first chairs, the first professors in natural history, technology, were here together in this, in this Uraneum, and we had famous, um, famous researchers here in the Uraneum, like uh, Friedrich Moos, who invented this famous Moos scale of hardness, and our most successful student um, was Nikola Tesla, who get his, who get his academic training here yeah, in Graz. It's always a good example for students because uh, Nikola Tesla was not a successful student at, here at the Uraneum because he was a gambler, so he lost all the money he needed to study, and he was then expelled from the university. But 50 years later on, he got then the honorary doctorate sent to the United States. Yeah, so I hope that you will enjoy your stay here in Graz, that you will enjoy your stay at the Uraneum. I'm looking forward to the results of this conference, especially then, of course, the project that will then be realized later on, hopefully, uh, in Afflands. Uh, and yeah, all the best. And of course, thanks also to our own team from the Institute for Art in Public Space, uh, Elisabeth Fiedler, who will, to whom I give the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Wolfgang, Mr. Director. Um, good morning. I just would like to tell you a little bit about the story and the history of this project. We, as the Institute of Art and Public Space, are always connected to different places, to different landscapes, and we want to know about the stories, about the history, the economics, the political circumstances, what does a region need, or how can we work uh, with different nations, and which questions do different nations ask for. So, um, 
I knew that Milica Tomic was connected to Wagner Athlans before, and uh, it was that I got in touch to the mayor, Peter Stradner from Wagner, and he is one of the very deepest connected men to work with history, to work with their own history, and uh, we decided to start this project again. So I could ask Milica Tomic if she was uh, interested again to work with us to doing together. And together it means I'm always very interested to do a um, collaborative uh, projects. And so um, we could um, do it together with Milica Tomic and uh, Philip Sattler from EZK, from the Technical University, the mayor of Wagner, Peter Stradner, the Bildungshaus Schloss Retzhof, they all work, uh, are connected to this um, project, Patricia Teisel and Joachim Gruber, thank you very much, Co. BB, Philipp Assinger and Elke Gruber, and us, the Institute for Art in Public Space, uh, to build this project together. We started in, I think it was 2014, around, uh, when we met and uh, discussed how to how to deal with this project and how to um, to manage the many many different questions, because Afland's um, Außenlager, as Wolfgang Muchic said, death and labor camp during World War II, from February 1944 to April 1945, was built from SS by forced laborers from. To, to, I think 201 pr prisoners from Mauthausen for this Katzat, Katzat satellite camp. This camp was connected to a 500 meter distance tunnel where at about 1,000 forced laborers and 2,000 civil workers had to work for the Motor Vehicle Corporation and Arms Factory Steyr Daimler Puch AG. In 1945, when the Red Army was coming, the camp was breaked off and 476 prisoners were sent to walk to the camp in Ebensee, 300 kilometers away. 60 people died on the way there. The question Milica Tomic is dealing with is, how do we narrate the history of this concentration camp? The challenge hereby is to maintain the place with its intentions contexts and histories. We have the place, we have the history, the living materials, found materials from the time of duration of the camp in their soul, oral history, language and discourse. Out of this, Milica Tomic is searching for the not yet found, for a possibility to realize a different form of memorialization. Last year, so we, we started to discuss this and to work on this uh, position. And last year, the cooperation was expanded with Steirischer Herbst. And the exhibition, this was the title, Exhibition of a Trowel's Edge, Research and Investigative Processes of Afflands Memorial in Becoming, was realized in Forum Stadtpark, as well as several talks. Today and tomorrow, in the symposium and conference, Life of Corp Crops, Towards an Investigative Memorialization will be held, as we all know. Uh, and for this cross-disciplinary project, Milica Tomic invited to 22 international authors from fine arts, from culture theater, feminism, archeology, span history, anthropology, technology or architecture, so we can learn more about nationalism, colonialism, violent destructions, appropriation of soil and land, agriculture experiments, political violence, ecological activism, the connection between economy, politic, and violence, how politics is materializing in landscape, labor migration in economical, historical, or ideological contexts ongoing more and more knowledge and interrelationships will bring us all to new thoughts and possibilities to questioning a new 
how to deal with history, present, and future. And Milica Tomic is going on in her structure of working. And so I want to thank you all. Thank you, Milica. Thank you, all the cooperation partners. You're very welcomed for two very intense days. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome also from the side of the conference conveners. Uh, we're really happy that you're here today. Uh, my name is Philip Sattler, and I will try to give a bit of a wider framework of people and institutions that made this project possible, and also to give a bit of praise and space to these people. Um, the context and topical starting point for this whole project and memorial is the history of a former concentration camp, Aflens an der Sulm, which was in operation in 1944 and 45 in southern Styria. Nowadays, almost nothing remains of the sites of this atrocious, atrocious history, you know. Um, and it is thanks to a few really great individuals that we are now gathered here today and can discuss and think about a memorial in this time today. First of all, it is one important person who is Franz Trampusch. Franz Trampusch was a boy who was living on a farm inside the camp and already, you know, as at a young age of around 10, 11 years old, was seeing these atrocities, but also the everyday efforts of resistance and the small acts of help that were given by his mother and others in this place. Later in his life, politically active, he was also uh, two times mayor of the municipality of Wagner. He always kept insisting on remembering, on educating people young and old. He's the one reason why we are at this moment gathered here, and he was the one who kept the memory alive. So I would like to give him an applause today. One of the people who Franz Trampusch took under his wing is the current mayor, uh, Peter Stradner, who is also here today, who is really somebody who fights on a local level for this project and supports it uh, with, with great effort and a really a great mind as well. Um, he is like Franz Trampusch, a Mauthausen guide as well. He addresses the past in a country uh, that is trying for decades to frame its role in World War II as the role of the first victim. Without him, this project wouldn't be possible, and we would also like to give him an applause today. Um, this project is also carried by other local institutions, uh, notably Retzhof, um, presented by Joachim Gruber, who is also here with us today, and who is also supporting um, via his institution that is an institution of education, of thinking, um, that is bringing uh, a new generation uh, of guides, of thinkers, who will uh, develop this uh, memory further, also in a local context. So we would like to thank him for this. <laughs> As every project, also this had a beginning. Um, it was Werner Fenz, who sadly passed away in 2016, who brought together a lot of the people um, that are gathered around this project nowadays and a workshop held at Retzhof where the first ideas around this project were actually proposed and which is still at the core of what we work today. Elisabeth Fiedler, whom you already heard speaking today, uh, took bravely up this project that was um, sort of not going forward at this point in time and really brought together all these partners, assembled these people and made it into this project that we have now uh, the honor to also be part of today. Um, it's really uh, something that her institution, uh, Art in Public Space, is really somebody, or she and her team, is really something that is supporting this project, working with this project, and without her and her great people, we would not be here. So really, thank you as well. And <laughs> give her One individual uh, who worked at the Institute uh, of Art in Public Space together with Elisabeth Fiedler and who brought life to this project and whose mind, soul, friendship and audacity is really in like every aspect of the work that we do. 
uh, is Dirk Möllmann. Dirk Möllmann sadly passed away quite recently, and we would like to dedicate this uh, conference to his memory and the memory of Werner Fans, who can sadly no longer be with us today. And we would like to just honor them with a moment of silence and remember. So, Filomeno Fusco, um, who is now part of Art in Public Space, um, picked up this project and really was a tremendous uh, inspiration. He's somebody who expanded the range, the thinking around this project and brought new dimensions to it. He's somebody who supports and pushes this project for quite a while now and we would really like to thank him with an applause. We would also like to thank Barbara Thaler and Johannes Leitig, um, who were part of this project, are still part of this project, and are really a joy to work with. Um, and we would also like to give them an applause. <laughs> the conference is called Life of Crops. This suggestion actually comes from Anna Besic, who is also here today with us. She's an archaeologist and thinker who worked with us on the project and who kept discussing and thinking with us. And we really appreciate her, her mind, and her great uh, personality that she brings to this. And we would really like to thank her for this. <laughs> we would also like to thank um, the people who made this event possible and who you will encounter um, during the next few days in different roles. This is Stanislav Tomic, Otto Kaltner, Markus Davric, Udo Kalil, Anto, Anto Petrosic, Vanya Stojanovic, Philip Rohrmeier, Dejan Markovic, Simon Overhofer, and especially Barbara Rauch. A round of applause for them. <laughs> we also thank Shiga Testen and his team at Public Office for their contribution in terms of graphic design and the web display that you can all encounter on our homepage. And especially also the people of Universal Museum Joanneum, who supported and made this space possible. This is Franz Atlasnik, Nico Norilla, Andreas Umfara, the people working in security, cleaning, and all the people and workers who often go unnoticed in the background, whose work enables this space and enables us to be here today. So I would also like to applaud them. <laughs> we also thank all the conversants who assembled here today, and you will have the privilege um, to encounter uh, during the next few days, and really welcome. Last but not least, we would also like to thank the Future Fund uh, for the Republic of Austria, as well as the National Fund for Victims of National Socialism, who financially supported this conference. <laughs> for now, um, I would like to invite Milica Tomic and Dubrovka Sekulic, who worked with me on this conference and who are really made this an in incredible opportunity and this event that is here today. And you will hear a bit more from them what this is all about. Thank you. for this really a uh, great way to unpack and some kind of explosion you know of this of 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 the event that always looks like uh, closed and the whole process that 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 stands behind this um, so thank you everybody for for uh, for coming it is actually a real joy to have you here and uh, I would like, I, I, uh, so Dubravka and I, we worked very closely together with Philip and Ovil. So we worked uh, very, very, and with all the people who, who were mentioned. And, but uh, we would like to say, I would say just a few words um, about the idea that stands behind this conference. And um, that actually, um, and Dubravka will later somehow uh, explain how this uh, how this resolves uh, in the in the in the content of the conference and the speakers the, the teams and everything that will that you will contribute uh, to this event 
so the idea was actually to to gather different knowledges and disciplines that reconsider memorialization practices and specifically how to think about the memorial in the contemporary condition, the state of the permanent war, the war that doesn't resolve in peace. So that, and as our actuality is actually defined with this never ending war and how to think about the memorial not as a, in a static terms, in ossified terms of memorialization practices, rather as changing and also fluid evolving. So we propose a novel trajectory that is an investigative memorialization that we want also to test actually and to, it is in making. So we, I, will, I will tell some kind of principles that stands behind this, but it is in making. And this conference is also uh, meant to be like a, 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 a making proce process of, 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 this, of this conception. Um, so this concept began to emerge with group Aspomenik, and I have to tell, I was, I was part of this group, and uh, I'm still, uh, because I really don't know if this group still exists or not. And this is very, you know, this is not this kind of uh, a post-socialist, you know, groups that works, that still work in neoliberal conditions. Uh, it is a kind, this is a post-genocidal group, and this is a group that is in a permanent dissolution. Um, so, so the concept began to emerge with the group Aspomenik, uh, that is the art and the theory group, whose focus was politics of memorialization, wars against Yugoslavia, because we still don't have a name of this war, so Grupa Spomenik decided actually to give a name that this is a war against Yugoslavia. Uh, in the 90s and the post-genocidal society. So Grupa Spomenik states that there is no memory without politics, which means that there is no memory without political subjectivation. So in this light, Branimir Stojanovic, who will be one of the speakers, and one who is also one of the founders of the Monument Group, uh, when we invited him, Dubravka and I, to the conference, made observation that when we talk about National Socialism, it is an imperative to look at World War II as a crisis of capitalism and moment in which capitalism, along with colonial practices, returned to the European soil and this certainly redefines how we view contemporality. So as being in the state of a permanent war. So which bring us back to the politics of memory and the way it was practiced by the monument group. So there is no memory without political subjectivation. We consider as a crucial aspect also of this novel uh, practice. So when we say investigation, we don't mean academic research or a police-controlled detective or either forensic uh, investigation that is always centered on evidence and analysis or collecting evidence for the sake of demonstrating the truth about atrocity. We, on the contrary, do not look for the proof. Investigation, in this sense, is about the knowledge that we gain by going deep into the matter through the procedure of discovery, it, it is based on understanding and establishing relations by going deep into the matter of our object of interest where, while creating and understanding the context. And at the same time, the dynamic process is creating new contexts that has yet to be discovered. So the first display of our investigation was last year, as we heard, uh, at Steirish at Herbst, at the exhibition which was titled At the Travel's Edge, Towards an Investigative Memorialization. At the Travel's Edge is also like a concept that comes from archaeology, and I will also explain 
why this is so important for us. And uh, also this way, yeah. So when we started working last year, we started with an archeological prospection. So this was the first thing we have done. Excavation that helps to understand and learn not just about the site of affluence under Sum and its past through various findings, like remains of a garbage pit from the Second World War, but also a small, almost invisible residues, like archaeobotanical or zooarchaeological and other remains. Seeds and they are that are very precisely talking about the space and the time in between of the closing of the camp in 1945 to today. Because what we are interested, we are also interested, not also, but very much in from the time, uh, so from the closing the camp to today. Because as we heard, it is today, it is a big cornfield happening there. Um, And this points to what are the means and material consequences, results of the history and suppressing history of this place. So we also learned another kind of archeology span that took place that discovered and digged into the question realm of law related to labor, the configuration of property relations in Styria, for example, and construction of a new entity in Austria, the new aristocracy, the so-called Grossbauer, the large-scale farmer, established and constructed through the laws like Reichserbhofgesetz, the land heritage law of the state heritage farm law in 1933 in Germany, and then in Austria in 1938. In the time of Austrofascism, the law which was in operation till 1999. So very soon we will hear also maybe more about this. And maybe we will also have an opportunity to listen about this from Philip. So investigative memorialization makes the particular site of affluence and their soon readable as a nod in the entanglement of larger global networks of socioeconomic conditions, revealing the ways how nature, agriculture, labor laws, property regulations, and everyday life continuously ride into the place. It revealed the ways in which it was hidden and suppressed through history and present by the means of transdisciplinary practice, especially learning from post-processual reflexive archaeology in the terms of methodology and materialist history. So in this sense, Investigative memorialization seeks for a collaborative, trans, I, don't, I can't say disciplinary, and I will say why. So approach that considers memorialization as a living investigative process of resembling, actualizing, and activating memory and knowledge of the present. So the idea of this conference is to develop theoretical and practical tools which enable a novel form of memorialization to appear as an entanglement of different but interconnected fields, science and technology, art, human rights and law, history and landscape, and archeology. span So it gathers authors who understand and confront their disciplinary practice. In that sense, it is also a non-academic. So it introduces art also as a practice that opens and creates new spaces, ones that does not conform conform the disciplinary boundaries as a way to resist the idea of professionalization and the notion of expertise. So all who are going to take part, we don't look at experts. And uh, so investigative memorialization has an important aspect that is a non-commemorative aspect. So this is also one of the m important principles that isn't about commemoration. Uh, it rather investigates the circumstances, condition, and events that are to be memorialized. In other words, investigative memorialization opposes the idea of commemoration caught between victims and perpetrators as two opposite and fixed identities, each representing its own position 
in a frozen and stabilized ossifying relationship. So this concept also brings into question the notion of temporally contained event. Instead of an inert historical closure, we look at the event as a spatial and temporal continuity. So, I will go back now. So, this commem the, the un this anti commemorative practice that stands for investigation that reveals and in, in introduces hidden knowledge by means of cross analytical practice on the sites where certain anti events were hidden and suppressed throughout the history along to the present, looking for different practices and knowledges and learning from the post-processual reflexive archeological methodology and material historical practice, investigative memorialization defines and makes this particular site readable by pointing out how it connects with the world in a larger global network of political, economical, social uh, framework and condition. And actually, Dubrovka, uh, who is the heart of this conference, uh, re will also reveals of what does it mean in the terms of our conference, Life of Crops, that will come to us now. So first, Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Philip, and thank you, Milica, for giving these previous conceptual and contextual coordinates of Affluence Memorial and Becoming project and the concept of investigative memorialization. And I also, I will try to give the third coordinate maybe, uh, but uh, I first also really wanna thank you, Milica, personally, for opening up this space that uh, which allows all of us to kind of enter and think together with you and especially for me, which has been amazing because through this concept, I also found a way to tie in so many things I was interested in. And those who know me know there is, that's always a challenge. <laughs> and, uh, and, to to, to, and also to feel that we are working on something which kinda a little bit responds to the urgency in which we live. So thank you so much yeah. for this. So we have tried with this uh, we, we, and we hope we're gonna start to establish this uh, with the next two days, the to set only to start to have to to have open up this space where we can think together with each other about, and together with this proposal of investigative memorialization, and as a kind of a space for thinking in which we can meet and uh, and to bring to to bring our kind of knowledges that we have, but also to bring those knowledges that we think we should have but we lack and that we can in that context leave our discipline, like what we think we have to perform as knowledge given the disciplinary formations we have and, and ha give ourselves also a freedom to think that is beyond what is expected. And that also, and to in this way also try to recover some kind of a join of thinking with to and thinking together and not just thinking in isolation. Uh, and, uh, and uh, also understanding that staying within disciplinary boundaries today and probably never was really enough to deal with what to the world and especially if wanna think and deal with the future if it's gonna exist at all. And also knowing that we cannot, when we started to think about this conference, we also knew we we cannot possibly even know who we can invite, but we also cannot know to, to which kind of a disciplines, disciplines we can invite. So we, so really important part of this conference was an open call, which allowed us not only to meet some amazing people whose work we didn't uh, know and not, uh, and unfortunately we were not able to invite all of them uh, because we were overwhelmed with the number of uh, responses we found, we got. But this was also incredible because it opened up for us ways of thinking about this, this co project and this concept and this topic in relation to many, uh, many different disciplines that we didn't necessarily think about 
when we were starting. So we knew that we want to have, that we need to have someone coming from law, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we knew that we have to have people coming from some other disciplines and, uh, and, and, uh, or, and people doing it in a completely different. Yeah. This is also because while there is something like memory studies and there are already, pre there are a lot of memorials and there is kind of a ways of prepare how this is supposed to be done, this is still no, this is still not super professionalized field. There is no one who because you you in the in the most even most conservative situation you need at least a conversation between a historian and an artist, in order to put something in space and some urban planning office to give you permission. But uh, uh, but uh, so 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 in that context, this investigative memorialization really opens up a space to be inhabited. But those, all of those who think that, who understand and think and feel that there is an urgency for to think together, and about this continuity, about the kind of resonance of the past and, the, and with the future and with what we live today, and uh, and so so we really tried, and as Milita already mentioned, to invite thinkers who in their work really understand not only the limits of disciplinary. Uh, of their disciplinary boundaries, but also they understand that the epistemic violence that exists at the core of their, most of their, most of the formal disciplinary formations we have, and uh, and uh, and I will now kind of give you some kind of a conceptual roadmap through the through the conference. Uh, so some of the no, no, some of the people who will have here and the knowledge is that we need and we think it's crucial to unpack this spatial event that is affluent uh, and its resonance till today is understand understanding war as an instrument as an integral instrumental of capital which will be brought by Erika Lies. Uh, the conference our conference also tries to posit privatization and property as ju both juridical concept that is developed in colonialism, which is something that come from Brenna Bander, is crucial for capitalism's cap capacity to racialize, which position that Andrew Hersher will put the light on, and, national, and to look also at national socialism as an attempt uh, for absolute privatization, which is something we take from Branimir Stojanovic. The conference also will look how the so, sort of neutralized concepts such as uh, cultivation, plantation, and expertise are used to further enclose not only bodies, nature and land, but also imaginary and, uh, per and even perception. Uh, the, concept of, uh, the concept of property, which turns soil and land from living thing into an abstraction, produces a new type of subjectivity which is defined by ability to own not only the land and what grows and lives on it, but also those who work it. Uh, and, and with this, then we also, with the, and with concept of property and this ability to own, we also have this emergence of the figure of the worker as one who does not own, and uh, among other figures that appear. Uh, but, uh, so we have the emergence of the figure of the worker as the one who does not own anything, and oh, sorry, I lost my free and uh, and uh, and uh, who does not own anything, and there is and ca but cannot also be uh, accept his freedom and labor power, which is does not own, and cannot be decoupled from concepts of slavery, which we claim, which we have to really understand how all these things still continue to inform our everyday and labor relations and not to see as something in past that, sto that stopped. And we will have some positions that not only historically explain us that, but really open up and to understand this, how this is at play today, although we don't necessarily use the terminology of, bef of, of before to name these or relations. Uh, what, uh, what seems to be left, the scorched earth and bare bones, which are rendered mute and suspended in the time by capital, are not really without the past and not without the future, and they are not without their knowledges and agency. And we will have positions which will really speak to this. By, returning to the, by refusing to return to the normative in this after war, which does, does not come peace, uh, because this normative is defined by capital, both we will look at ruin and desert uh, 
no, rather than understanding them, not to understand them as a failure and to be productive, but as a world-making realities in which epistemic violence produced by capital can not only be acknowledged, but also be encountered. This also means that we have to recognize the work by non-anthropogenic factors, such as work the soil itself does to repair and reconstruct. And while, it, uh, we, while the soil, and also understanding that while the soil plays so much, plays such an important role in this imaginary of fascism and national socialism and inability and capitalism to enclose, it also has its power in anti-colonial struggle. So we will also not only focus on, on one aspect, but we will also look how some of these categories which enclose can, with them we can think uh, other concepts as well. And, uh, and we will also look how the techniques such as in agronomy or seed engineering, they become these uh, carriers of memory and resistance and precisely because of their power to activate a counter memory of all these different practices that got erased by the capitalism. And hopefully we will also uh, be able to think towards the anti-capitalist and anti-colonial horizon where even the, the, all this concept that we found so problematic and utilized towards enclosure, such as cultivation and property, can help us think towards some more equitable world. And uh, we really hope that, we, and we are actually happy that you took our proposal and came here to think this with us. And uh, I will ask Oval to come and maybe give you more precise roadmap for, for today. to prepare everything or like uh, should I continue? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this work. Okay, I think we are all very excited to to start today, but uh, yes, let me uh, solidify our uh, road a little bit further. Uh, but of course, I first of all I have to say like it's such a honor for me to be part of this incredible team uh, of, uh, uh, of amazing thinkers and taking artistic thinking practice uh, to another level. Um, and uh, I believe, uh, as uh, Dubravka said, through this conference, uh, outside like the well-known categories uh, and normative uh, positions, we will be able to step into the uh, unknown uh, and uh, grow out of the rich constellations that uh, we will build together. Um, <coughs> um, maybe it's also good to um, uh, to remind, like the beautiful words of uh, of Don, Don Haraway, uh, whose text I think is very well known to uh, many of us here, that uh, in this space, that today to be able to live in the present more solidly, our task is to make kin in lines of inventive connection uh, as a practice of learning to live and die well uh, with each other in a thick present. And our task is uh, to make trouble, uh, to stir up potent response to devastating events, uh, as well as uh, to settle uh, troubled waters, uh, and also to rebuild quieter spaces. Um, <coughs> and within this attempt of like uh, making kin, uh, we will be uh, we will be uh, able to create different resonances, are kind of uh, um, uh, with our thinkers responding to each other, coming from uh, different disciplines, uh, and uh, uh, our uh, each session will be moderated uh, by uh, by one of us. And we will guide, um, we will have like presentations for 15 minutes. Uh, and afterwards, like we will uh, try to create a rich ground of questions, also enabling uh, your presence more further. 20 minutes. I thought of the 15 minutes. This was my space of 15 minutes. Thank you.
<laughs> yeah. So no worries, no worries. Um, <laughs> so we would like to welcome um, Bertrand Pertz. Uh, Bertrand Pertz is an historian at the Institute for Contemporary History at the University of Vienna specializing in the study of national socialism, forced labor, concentration camps, as well as memorials and culture of remembrance. His contribution today is crucial to and maybe the foundation for the understanding of the history of the place that is sort of at the background, at the context, as at the core also of this, con uh, of this conference at the same time, because it is really in a time of global amnesia that we uh, live now, crucial to look closely and precisely at the history that permeates our livelihoods. History can make us understand where we are and how we can relate to places in our contemporary global capitalist context. His talk is titled The Scene of the Crime, the Invisibility of the Concentration Subcamp Afflens an der Sulm. And we would welcome him to the stage. Which is my presentation. I have your guess. <laughs> Can I move? Is this, is this, is, I don't know which uh, the three or three and so is this, I think this is mine. Mm -hmm. This is nice. Maybe this is not mine. No, 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 that's not mine. Maybe this one. <laughs> no, 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 no. So maybe in this one. So, okay, so it's this one. So, So, okay, <laughs> so good morning. Uh, many thanks uh, for inviting me to this conference. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be the first to speak uh, to you here. For me, uh, it is a rather an unusual role to stand uh, before you as an historian at such a conference. Normally, I speak uh, about the history of concentration camp uh, camps uh, at historical symposia or uh, within the framework of memorial uh, uh, programs. My role here is to briefly tell you something about the little known history of the concentration subcamp and forced labor in Afflens and the Sulm. Afflens and the Sulm is a small village in uh, southern Styria, less than 50 kilometers from Graz. Afflens belongs to the municipality Wagner in the district Leibniz and has about 200 inhabitants. As in many places in southern Styria, there's a lot of agricultural agriculture here. It would be an unknown place if there were no special limestone under the ground. The limestone of this area has been used for buildings since Roman times, and so over the centuries an underground quarry was created, which today bears the name Römer Steinbruch, and has also gained fame under this name. The stone creates connecting lines to the outside, so in the 19th century it was also used in the construction of the Wiener Ringstraße, Vienna Ring Road, for example, in the Natural History Museum. It was this underground factory with uh, several thousand square meters of floor space that prompted the armament uh, company Steyrdam La Puch in early 1944 to relocate part of its production of aircraft, engine parts, and tank parts from Graz Tondorf um, uh, there. This was to protect production from the increasing Allied air raids to convert the quarry into an underground factory. Concentration camp inmates from Mauthausen were deported to Afflands and the satellite camp was set up next to the quarry. The camp existed from February 1944 to April 1945. The prisoners, almost 1,000, uh, came mainly from the Soviet Union, Poland, the German Reich, and Yugoslavia. Steyr Damler Puch uh, moved more than 
1060 machine tools from Graz to Uflands in mid-1944. For, for production, a larger civilian workers' camp was set up next to the subcamp in which 2,000 people from the Graz Trondorf workforce uh, was accommodated, including many civilian forced laborers. The difficult working and living conditions led to the death of at least 78 prisoners. In a quarter of the death, suicide by hanging or shooting on the run was recorded more than in comparable subcamps, which suggests a particularly high potential for violence among the SS camp personnel. With the approach of the Red Army, the camp was evacuated at the beginning of April 1945, and the prisoners were transferred to the Ebensee subcamp in Upper Austria on food, marches, uh, food in marches lasting several days. These evacuation marches resulted in further killings. The exact number is still somewhat unclear. The events in Afflens refer us to numerous contexts. First of all, the economic context. The motor vehicle uh, and the moment company, Stardam La uh, expanded during the war with state investments uh, to become a large company of the German armaments industry and was the largest armaments group on Austrian territory. In addition to rifles, vehicles, aircraft engines, tanks, and ball bearings were produced. The main site in Steyr and Graz were massively expanded after 1938, as the Austrian territory was still beyond the range of Allied aircraft until the mid middle of the war, and was therefore particularly attractive as a production location. In addition, two weapon factories were taken over in occupied Poland, in Warsaw, and in Radom. Another context is the course of the war. Within the, with the Allied stra strategic air warfare, the German Reich was faced with the challenge of how to maintain production under the condition of the air war. This was essential for the continuation of the war. For this reason, from mid-1943 onwards, the most important armament factories were relocated underground. For this purpose, existing underground rooms were used as in Afflands, but also completely new underground factories were built. From summer 1943, Allied aircraft were able to reach Austrian territory. The relocation of production from Graz to Afflands should therefore be seen in the context of the underground relocation program of the German war industry. For the construction and adaption of underground rooms, well over 100,000 concentration camp prisoners were called upon in the German Reich, who were regarded as a labor reserve still av available after many million of foreigners, men and women, had already been compulsorily recruited for the German war economy. Afflens must therefore also be seen in the context of the general use of forced labor. The decision to establish the concentration subcamp also refers to the context of slave labor in the concentration camps, which from the middle of the war was primarily, primarily intended to serve war economy. The camp in Afflands was one over, one over 40 subcamps of the Mauthausen concentration camp on Austrian territory and one of several subcamps set up in the interest of Steyrdam Buch. Of the company's workforce, which rose to about 50,000 uh, by 1944, about half were foreign forced laborers. In addition, there were about 20,000 concentration camp inmates who had to perform slave labor for the interest of, of the company, as well as Jewish prisoners and of the Warsaw and Wadom ghettos. There were a number of other contexts uh, to, for affluence, such as the role of uh, technical intelligence in such projects. At the beginning of 1944, the relocation of productions, uh, productions based on Ford's assembly line model to underground rooms was largely untested and considered a technical challenge. 
the aim was to maintain the effectiveness of production as far as possible. The precondition for Steyr-Dembler Buch's use for the underground space was geological expertise prepared by the Viennese Un University of Technology in order to check the stability and bump resistance. Engineering and architectural, architectural offices were involved in the concrete planning of an, uh, of an underground factory. In this specific case, an architectural office in Graz carried out the factory planning. In addition, there was the enormous pressure of time, which was primarily uh, to the uh, the, the treatment of the working conditions of the concentration camp prisoners. So much uh, brief historical classification of Arflens. In the second part of my presentation, I would like to deal with the question of visibility and invisibility of processes like in Arflens. From the German point of view, strict secrecy was essential for such projects. The ultimate goal was to conceal the underground locations of armaments production from the Allies. The site was declared a restricted area. Here you can see the rest of the so-called guardhouse, which func functioned as a checkpoint. The use of uh, concentration camp prisoners was very functional in terms of secrecy, since uh, it prevented workers from communicating with the outside world. It is therefore no coincidence that no photo of the concentration subcamp and of the forced labor in the quarry has turned up to this day. For a long time, we only had this drawing of a former uh, inmate uh, of this, his name was Robert Gretzinger. The only photographs we have had for only a few years are allied aerial photographs which for the first time really show us the topographical situation on, on site. Uh, on, the, on the left side, you see the uh, forced labor camp, and uh, uh, in, on the top, in, in the middle of the, the picture, you see the entrances to the underground factory. On the, on the right side, on the far right side, you see a part of uh, the concentration camp. Uh, and here's a better picture of uh, the concentration camp with uh, the way fenced uh, 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 for the prisoners, uh, it's the way to the underground uh, factory. The um, yeah, the visibility of the camp, the expansion of the gallery and the production was thus limited during the war, except for the group of people involved. Nevertheless, there was uh, a not too small group of people who could observe the concrete events. Thus, the population living in Afrens could closely observe the treatment uh, of the prisoners. There were daily contacts with SS and company personnel, however, the events were also visible for tradesmen who supplied the camp or the underground factory, to civilian employees of Steyr Daimler Buch who traveled back and forth between Graz and Afflens, or to representatives of the authorities who had to do their work on site. The secrecy, of course, also had its effects on the possibilities of histori historical research and memorialization. In the last part of my presentation, I would like to deal briefly with this question of visualization and invisibilities after the war in the case of Afflens. In general, it can be said that in the first post-war decades, the connection between industry, forced labor, and concentration camps, as we find it here in the Afflens case, was not a subject, subject of public discourse in Austria. The official Austria, Austria positioned the official Austria positioned itself as the first victim of national socialism and did not confront itself with the question of its own responsibility of Nazi crimes. The concrete developments in in Afrens in the post-war period, uh, which can be characterized as absence, reinforced the fading out of history. At the end of the war, 
SS members and the camp inmates were no longer on the scene and the camps were torn down. Here's a recent photograph of the field where the concentration camp one stood. An existing mass grave was exhumed. The machines were dismantled by the occupying powers and the underground factory was turned into a, a quarry again. The Armament Company Steyrdam Le Buch continued to produce as an important Austrian nationalized company. Now machines and vehicles of all kinds, cars, bicycles and motorcycles for civilian use were produced. The company was part of the post-war econo econ economic miracle and stood uh, paradigmatically for the new Austrian consumer society. In the company itself, with a few exceptions, there was a great continuity in management, but also in, uh, among the domestic skilled workers. Here, the entire history of the Nazi era was no longer discussed for decades. Requests from former forced laborers and concentration camp inmates for compensation were rejected un until the 1990s, arguing that the state was responsible for this. In contrast to the management of the company, the SS members, especially the three camp leaders who were in command one after the other in Afrance, were accused uh, before an, uh, a US military court in Dachau. Since these tri trials did not take place in Austria, however, this had no effect whatsoever on the local events. Also, the survivors repeated, repeatedly set acts of remembrance on camps such as Uplands. In Austria, concentration camp memorial sites were marginalized until the 70s. It was therefore only in the, in the 1980s that a small plaque of the community Wagner was placed at the Roman quarry to commemorate the crimes committed here. The connection between forced labor and the arms industry was not explained, however, as you can see, this is the text of the plug. The collective silence about what happened uh, was not at least prompted by historical scholarship. It was not until the 1980s 80s, that concentration subcamps became the subject of research. In general, it can be said that the history of concentration camps in German-speaking countries has only developed into a field of research in the last 30 years. The research on satellite camps itself, in turn, was confronted above at uh, all at the beginning with the fact that sources were scattered all over the world as a result of the war. The former prisoners, who could be interviewed as contem contemporary witnesses, lived mostly outside Austria, scattered in Europe, the USA, or Israel. Memory reports were often not published or written in languages, languages that first had to be translated. Companies such as Stadam Le Buch usually reacted very cautiously when it came to making sources available. This only changed slowly in the 1990s against the background of the debate about compensation for forced laborers. The Allied military sources, such as the aerial photograph shown, have only become accessible in the last tw uh, two decades. A growing interest in a critical, historically, uh, a critical history on the ground, which we have been able to, do, to observe uh, for several, several decades, has to struggle with this difficult source situation, situation, especially if they are not professional actors in history. In addition, there is the fact that there, have, that there are hardly any contemporary witnesses left who can give a well-founded account of that time. The possibilities to make up for the long neglected preoccupation with the history of the satellite camp such as Uplands are thus limited. Nevertheless, there are many possibilities to communicate the invisible and the absent and to make them accessible. Here, archaeology in places of recent uh, crimes 
plays a very important role when other sources are no longer available. As far as dealing with places such as affluence is concerned, research and memorial memorialization are closely linked. Both approaches can sometimes come into conflict with each other, but they are both indispensable. My findings of uh, the current situation in affluence is, are ambivalent. On the one hand, there have been located initiatives for many years, above all Franz Trampusch, uh, but uh, also the community representatives who are involved in questions of memorialization. There are also artistic uh, projects, uh, such as uh, the Wächterhaus project, which took the former checkpoint as an opportunity to set a sign of memory in the landscape. And of course, that which is currently being set in motion by Militia projects and which um, places affluence in a global context. On the other hand, we also have to deal with conscious and unconscious fading out. The current owner of the gallery, Stein von Krein, a company in Graz, advertises the limestone from affluence on her homepage with a re review of the history of the site, but the use of concentration camp prisoners and civilian forced laborers is not mentioned at all. The narrative is completely different. The enormous effort is emphasized with which a branch of the Steyr Daimler Puch was transferred to the mountain in the shortest time, the dismantling of the machines by the Soviet Union and their plans to blow up the gallery are particularly emphasized. The British occupation power, on the other hand, is praised as the savior of the quarry uh, from destruction. The example uh, with which I would like to end shows how little conscious institutions are sometimes of the subject, subject that are not directly involved in this case. In Austria, the Dorotheum is a, the central institution through which works of art, as well as all kinds of objects of daily use are auctioned. In 2016, the picture shown here was offered in an auction catalog in Salzburg. It shows Burghausen in Bavaria. The name of the painter, his date of birth was also mentioned. Only the date of death was uncertain. The name of the painter is Paul Rieken. The Dorotheum offered the painting without a single check as to who the painter might be. Once used briefly by Google, it would have revealed that the artist was the last camp leader of Afflens, but had also previously counted among the narrower management personnel of the Mauthausen concentration camp. Regan was responsible for the photographic documentation at the Mauthausen concentration camp for several years, so he photographed all this around the camps, especially so-called shootings on the run. Rieken had an artistic education and taught at a grammar school in Essen during the interwar period. He was sentenced to life imprisoned in Dachau, but released early in 1954. By the way, the Dorotheum justified itself to me by pointing out that it was not possible to check every one of the many paintings offered for sale and that Paul Rieken was unknown to them as an artist. A remarka remarkable statement in view of the fact that today paintings generally have to be examined before auction because of the possi possible suspicion of art theft. From my point of view, an investigative memorialization should also include the history of such fade outs. Thank you very much. This works. Uh, thank you very much, Beth and Pert. It Actually, this is like a, uh, first we think actually apart uh, from this lecture now that in this time of global amnesia, it is like a must to have, you know, a history lesson to understand where we are and the context where we 
that we inhabit in this moment. So, uh, but thank you for this inspiring and uh, historical analysis of the, so, and thank you for sharing. I think that this uh, uh, related to the painting and to the author is uh, great and very inspiring. And actually this uh, is also showing so much um, uh, how the way working with you was always bringing things really forward in, a, in an unexpected directions. Uh, we will now continue uh, uh, first uh, 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 because uh, there is a question, are we going to have a question to your uh, talk? Yes, we will during the conference, we will come back. Um, I think what is important that we continue now also in the sense of, uh, of the next panel. And um, I would like to introduce, actually, to continue the conference with the panel uh, with Brenna Bandar, who is a legal theorist at the School of Oriental and African Studies, the University of London, and the author of a groundbreaking book, Colonial Lives of Property, and Branimir Stojanovic, a uh, psychoanalyst, philosopher, and artist. Uh, the title of this panel is Property Studies from Private to Societal Property. Thank you, Branimir, for suggesting this title. So uh, we will start the conference, uh, we will uh, continue the conference with a discussion on a property which sits at the core of all entanglements of what once used to be a capitalist society. We are still, you know, puzzled if there are still exists society or capitalism. So we will not just discuss the property as such, but we will focus on cultivation as a means of appropriation of indigenous lands and the way to impose private property relations while opening towards other forms of property as an answer of the break of promise of the French Revolution and the emergence of the European ownership society in the light we will discuss belonging as a form of property, as a possible, and Branimir's proposition that is a societal property. Um, so I would ask Dubrovka now to, because I am actually just, Brenna, please, please come. So, I'm just like helping Dubrovka now because Dubrovka is like a splitted person here. She will also moderate the conference and she will also translate Branimir Stojanovic from a Serbo Croatian language to, to German. So, um, what did I say to This is like, I'm too long in Graz, but this is nice that I, uh, you know, first put this language. So, um, Yes, please, Dubravka, if you would like yeah. to introduce, and okay, then you, do you need to, um, you can talk for, for yeah. I think yes. I need to switch to my computer. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, but I just need to yeah. do the slides. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
us standing towards the transformative, and there I say revolutionary, stressing that it is especially because, quote, the capacity of property law to transform and establish social order, end of the quote, one can think property and uh, one can think with property a politic and change and life beyond the boundary. Brianna comes here from London and uh, the book was published last year by Duke University Press and will be there, there and part of our library. Thank thanks, you, Brianna. So, thanks a lot. Um, thanks so much, Dubrovka, for that uh, very warm welcome. And I also want to thank uh, Milica and Philip and uh, Oval for the, for the invitation. I'm very excited to be here, actually. Um, I think um, when I was listening to your comments in the uh, introductory session about uh, thinking about memorialization as an investigative method, I think uh, we had a workshop the other day on uh, abolition and reparation. And I think um, there's some interesting parallels maybe we can talk about uh, later um, about this idea of memorialization as investigative method and, uh, and what reparation means um, as a method of, of historical and, and contemporary inquiry. Okay, um, I just said to Dubrovka I shouldn't have used visual images in a room full of artists because <laughs> my level of visual literacy is actually quite low um, being a, being a uh, being from the field of law, um, but I, I will use a few just quotations and things. Okay, um, I want to begin my talk with reference to a very salient instance of how law and indeed living soil, uh, which I think always maintains some form of independence from the lived built environment that feeds off of it, remains mired in a racial colonial ideology of improvement uh, that is one of the key forces in capitalist modes of accumulation. Last week, the phase one report of the Grenfell Tower inquiry was released, renewing focus in the media on the horrible tragedy that occurred in 2017. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, uh, but a fire uh, that began on the fourth floor of a high rise tower in a West London neighborhood leapt up 19 floors in a matter of 12 minutes. Um, the fire led to the deaths of 72 people, including 19 children. The majority of the residents of the tower were social housing tenants, uh, with, a, with a small minority being the tenants of private landlords. The fire, as we know from the evidence given in the first phase of the inquiry, was caused by a refurbishment of the building that took place between 2012 and 2016 that rendered the building structurally unsafe. The exterior of the building during this refurbishment was clad in material that was as combustible as petrol. The refurbishment took place in order to improve the tower, which had been built in the 1970s, in a borough where gentrification has led to the greatest inequality in wealth out of any borough in the UK. While the improvement of the tower was meant to address structural problems like heating and damp, it was also noted many times by local residents that the, the addition of the exterior cladding was meant to improve its aesthetic qualities for the benefit of the tower's extremely wealthy neighbors, the owners of multi-million pound flats. And indeed the crown of the building, which was constructed out of flammable materials, which greatly exacerbated the spread of the fire down other sides of the building, was not there for any functional reason, but was there as a kind of architectural flourish or signature. In addition to the loss of life, the homelessness and the psychic devastation that the fire caused, it also resulted in soil contamination in the area surrounding the tower. Soil samples taken from 140 meters from the, away from the tower, and here this just shows the radius of, um, of the toxicity, um, contain 40 times the typical amount of various carcinogens. Carcinogens that can cause asthma, cancer, and a host of other respiratory problems. Flame retardants that are toxic to the nervous system will remain in the soil, the dust, and the particulate matter in the internal and external radius outside of the tower f up to a distance of 1.2 kilometers. For the residents of the Lancaster West housing estate, 
and most particularly for the children who play on its grounds, there is no escape from the long-term devastation wrought by the privatized and financialized real estate market, which governed how the refurbishment was undertaken. This is the slow violence of contamination and debilitation that follows the spectacular tragedy of the fire. Now, the profit motive evident in the government's privatization of the management of social housing meant that under the guise of improvement, more than a dozen corporations who undertook the refurbishment were enriched by public funds. With complete disregard for the safety and ultimately the lives of the social housing tenants in the building, the institutional indifference, the racism, the organized abandonment, whatever term we use to grasp this tragedy, it seems the drive to accumulate through dispossession that was the motor force of colonial settlement remains very much with us in the present. The name Grenfell itself carries this history with it. The tower was named after Baron Francis Grenfell, a high-ranking British Army officer who fought in the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879, then the Anglo-Egyptian War, and finally went on to become the Commander-in-Chief of Ireland. Francis was also the grandson of the lesser known Pasco Grenfell, a governor of the Royal, Assurance, uh, the Royal Exchange Assurance Corporation, which in the 18th century sold policies to ensure maritime cargo, including slaves. Grenfell's stint as commander in chief in the 19th century in Ireland was preceded, of course, by centuries of British colonial rule. In 1651, William Petty, founder of modern political economy, was sent to Ireland as physician general to the British Army. It is in this colonial laboratory that Petty would conceptualize wealth as a fusion of the value of land with the value of people. Early attempts to measure land with the use of a cadastral survey coincided with the desire to measure the value of the population on the basis of their consumption and productive labor. So, to apologies to the historians in the room, I'm going to now dwell in this earlier moment. Um, okay, I'm not, I'm, I'll get there in a minute. Okay, well, the concept of improvement as the defining criterion for establishing a legitimate right to property finds its clearest expression in the work of John Locke. The conceptualization of value according to specific ideas of improvement, I think, originates in the work of William Petty. Furthermore, the idea that subjects who do not cultivate their lands for the purpose of market exchange need improvement themselves takes on a racial logic, fusing the rationale for ownership with a racial concept of the proper subject, a process I capture in the term racial regimes of ownership. We see in Petty's work the formulation of a scientific approach to the measurement of the value of land and people. The convergence of medical scientific understandings of the human body and anatomy specifically with a method of evaluation based on mathematics produced new forms of valuing land, produce, and people, and in turn justified new and emergent forms of colonial governance. In 17th century colonial Ireland, the value of land and populations were assessed on the basis of their productivity the value of land measured according to agricultural output, the value of people by their capacity to cultivate the land. And this is a formula that then repeats itself in many different colonial contexts, at least in the context of the British Empire. In Petty's writings, we see the beginnings of what could be termed an early labor theory of value, rendering the value of both land and human life. Let's see if the next slide, yeah, okay. <laughs> go back to the other one. Uh, the sub, uh, rendering the value of both land and human life as equivalences based on the cultivation of land. The subsequent evaluation of both uncultivated land and the people associated with subsistence modes of life as waste is distinctive, however, from the concept of a surplus population as elaborated by Marx. The colonial compulsion to improve the native was not conditioned by the need to create a reserve army of labor. Rather, what is evident is the desire to expel or criminalize populations who are not settled on the land and who do not engage in, engage in marketized forms of cultivation. So 
to go back to that other slide, the lack of fixity or the or a nomadic character of populations has long been a basis for their criminalization and expulsion from the body politic. Foucault points to the first economic analyses of delinquency in 18th century France, which identified the vagabond as a criminal element in society who deserved to be stripped of civil status. The 18th century witnesses both the criminalization of groups of people who are not tethered or fixed geographically to regular work, as well as the rise in statistical forms of knowledge aimed at the governance of these populations. Now, while Foucault does not address the colonial context, the criminalization of mobile groups of people found its legal expression, both in the colonial context as elsewhere, in the crime of trespass. In the aftermath of slavery, the complaint of vagrancy was routinely leveled against people who refused to submit to labor contracts that were designed to entrench their bondage and affix them to plantations under the ruse that they were now freely alienating their labor. Resonances of this colonial history find expression in the contemporary criminalization of squatters in urban spaces and the prohibition of begging on the street or even engaging in forms of commerce that are mobile, unfixed, and considered contraband. The death of Eric Garner in 2014 in New York City, murdered by the police, was preceded by his arrest for allegedly selling single cigarettes on the street from packs without stamps, tax stamps, rather. But coming back to land, First Nations who, prior to the arrival of settlers, engaged in mobile and seasonal forms of cultivation and labor were rendered as inherently inferior, demonstrably lacking the norms of propriety required for full civil legal status. The Irish were viewed from the beginnings of colonial settlement in the 17th century as somewhat less than human on account of the lack of permanence that characterized the dwellings of laborers. Although William Petty did not seem to attribute Irish laziness to the state of their bodily constitution, he did see Irish and English difference as somehow inherently biological. His solution for quelling Irish rebellion involved the intermarriage of English women and Irish men, and Irish women to English men, who would raise their children to be English speaking, and the whole economy of the family would be English. The deficiencies of the Irish could be ameliorated by mixing their blood with that of the English. And this appears as a precursor to the full-blown blood quantum racism in places like Australia in the 19th century, where the prevailing policy for several decades was to assimilate Aboriginal communities, starting with mixed race children who were perceived as closer to being white on account of their parentage. Petty's suggestion of mixing Irish and English blood through reproduction in order to produce a more industrious and disciplined population is akin to the method an agricultural scientist might utilize in their interbreeding of plant species to improve its yield. And I think we see how these logics travel across different uh, domains. While modern biological racism had yet to emerge, conceptions of racial difference and crucially European superiority was conditioned at this time by the concept of land use described previously. While Petty saw the Irish as capable of improvement, Jews were cast outside this paradigm altogether because at least in part of their tenuous relationship to the land. In his treatise of taxes, he distinguishes Jews not only on the basis of communal and religious difference, but on the basis of their chosen livelihoods, which in his view rendered them justifiably liable to higher taxes in well-populated countries. The anti-Semitic trope of the wandering Jew that was all too familiar by the 17th and 18th centuries colors Petty's assessment of Jews in Europe avoiding tax by not participating in the general economy with no attachment to land, Jews were cast outside the bounds of le legibility within the primary economy of landowners and laborers. The figure of the Jew is rendered in ways reminiscent of Foucault's vagabond as one who deserves to be stripped of her civil status and political rights due to her apparent lack of geographical fixity. It is also this form of anti-Semitism 
that arguably informs early Zionist emphases on laboring the land as key to the redemption of the Jewish people in Palestine. In the 19th century, the racial difference of First Nations encountered by the British is cast in civilizational terms. And finally, in the 20th and 21st centuries, race appears primarily as a discourse of cultural difference, not only in relation to First Nations, but with other racialized communities too. But whether the concept of racial difference is based in biology or culture, I argue that the racial subject of modernity is defined as a proper person on the basis of his or her capacity to appropriate, both on the level of interiority and exteriority. Any use of property that does not bear the hallmarks of individual ownership is deemed to be inferior, less valuable, available for appropriation. This logic of possessive individualism carries on very much into the present and, of course, spreads its tentacles far beyond actual relations of ownership. The imperative to quantify and measure, measure value, created an ideological juggernaut that defined people and land as unproductive in relation to agricultural production and deemed them to be waste and in need of improvement. The creation of an epistemological framework where people came to be valued as economic units set the ground for a fusing together of ownership and subjectivity in a way that had devastating consequences for entire populations who didn't cultivate their lands for the purposes of commercial trade and marketized exchange. These populations were by definition uncivilized and could be disposed of, cast outside the borders of political citizenship. The brutal displacement and dispossession of thousands of Irish that preceded the displacement of indigenous peoples in Canada, Australia, South Africa, Algeria, Palestine and elsewhere from their lands based on the political arithmetic of Petty and those influenced by his work such as Locke and Adam Smith is testament to the violence engendered by methods of measurement and quantification and, and conceptualizations of value defined primarily by economic productivity and individual ownership. Now, by way of conclusion, I, I want to turn back to the present. Oh, see, I always, yeah, okay. Uh, specific models of capitalist investment in the age of financialization colonize urban spaces on a global scale, much like the structural adjustment programs of the World Bank imposed on the third world from the 1970s onwards, whose echoes now haunt austerity racked Europe. This colonization through the use of a specific model of financialized real estate markets is imposed even where existing modes of use would, on the face of it, satisfy long established Lockean notions of improvement and productivity. So the, the need for a spatial fix, to draw on David Harvey's term, to make use of an over accumulation of capital overrides a mode of productive use and improvement that no longer serves the objectives of the overseers of financial capitalism. So we have this peculiar you know, contemporary moment where the ideology of possessive individualism is still very much with us, but where the needs of a, a very financialized capitalism uh, means that when it comes to things like real estate investment, uh, we see the, the colonization of urban spaces and the buying up, uh, uh, the decanting displacement of people from urban spaces, even where they are using and improving uh, um, the land in that older sense, in that Lockean sense. We can think of, you know, small business owners who are, uh, you know, um, displaced or, or uh, other, other subjects who, according to that other logic, um, fit a kind of uh, Lockean mode. Um, now, even though, as we know, the fundaments of property and contract law are necessary to its operation, racial capitalism requires a certain recombinant approach to its modes of extraction and appropriation, something that I explore quite a lot um, in the book, that things that are considered to be sort of pre-modern uh, rationales for ownership are often used in a recombinant way with more contemporary rationales for ownership. Uh, which is the same, uh, which is uh, completely enwrapped with 
you know, older uh, logics of racial difference uh, being combined with uh, newer ones, whether it's biological notions of racism or cultural notions of racism. So I use the term recombinant to, to describe the way that this, this works. Um, now we find ourselves in a moment where the ideology of possessive individualism, as I was saying a moment ago, exists alongside the entrepreneurial subject of competition, who is apparently deterritorialized and unbordered. But as we know from some of the colonial histories recounted here, that land made into property retains a distinctive place in contemporary forms of neoliberal capitalism. We also know how important land remains in neoliberal extractivist economies like that of the UK. To return to the scene of Grenfell, it is telling that even in the aftermath of such a tragic loss of life, the Tory-dominated council has at every turn tried to stop attempts by groups of people in the community to gain control over spaces where they can organize autonomously. This image is uh, an image of Theresa May, our, the prime minister who preceded the current disaster, <laughs> and she, she was also disastrous. Um, and, um, yeah, I don't know if, I, no, I wouldn't say she's a lesser evil, I'd say she's a different evil. <laughs> Sorry, this is being recorded. Okay, so um, this is an image of Theresa May um, going to the site of Grenfell Tower after the fire, right in the aftermath of the fire. And she arrives and stays completely encircled by police, police protection. So she didn't, um, you know, this, this, attitude, it's much more than an attitude of course, but the, the, the you know, the, the relationship that, the, that these members of, of a ruling elite have towards uh, the inhabitants, uh, the people of a community uh, like Grenfell is really um, quite shocking. You may, I don't know if it was reported, but, you know, Jacob Rees-Mogg, another um, uh, Tory MP, <laughs> I have to moderate my language. <laughs> uh, you know, recently made the the comment that uh, you know the the people who died in the fire died essentially because they they lacked common sense, and uh, in a disavowal that is always the real tell, proceeds to say, of course, this had nothing to do with race or class. Okay. Um, now, the fight to reappropriate land and urban space, and I can give some examples of this particular community in the Q&A after if people are interested in talking about it. Even, it's, even in its most fragmented, financialized, and provisional forms, continues as it has always done. And I appreciated very much Philip's comment about, uh, in his introduction, about um, how part of our investigations here require us to collectively develop a consciousness that enables us to see ha acts of resistance and modes of resistance that don't always uh, adhere to the kinds of um, political forms that we are uh, um, uh, most used to recognizing as legible forms of, of resistance. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Brenna very much for this uh, brilliant and inspiring talk. So, <laughs> uh, and, and bringing this interrelation of, 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 pro of, of property, cultivation improvement, and violence, and challenging actually our understanding of this, and maybe you know, opening this space for us to get sensibilized uh, in, in a different, in a different uh, uh, manner. Uh, I guess I guess the audience has a lot of questions, but as we already mentioned, we will have a discussion after both talks. So uh, now now I would like to invite Branimir Stojanovic, who is a psychoanalyst, philosopher, writer, with who I worked and from who I learned like more than twenty years, and. Um, He's a member of Belgrade Psychoanalytic Society and the International Association member of Slovenian Association of Lacanian Psychoanalysis. He's a founder and lecturer of the School of History and Theory of Images, as well as a founder and editor of 
the Prelom Break magazine. We have also other editors from uh, uh, and founders from the magazine, like Elena Vesic, who is also going to moderate the next panels. Um, Branim is the chief editor uh, of Archive Psychoanalyze, uh, Archive of the Psychoanalysis, uh, Archives Psychoanalyse magazine, founder of the, and the member of the art and theory group, Grupa Spomenik, and founding member of the library and self-education institution, Učitelj Neznalice i njegovi komiteti, Ignorant Schoolmaster and his committees. He is a published he, he has published essays, texts, and studies in the field of philosophy, theoretical psychoanalysis, critic of ideology, and art and theory. Uh, so Dubrovka, uh, Branim is uh, all yours. I'm, I'm just uh, as a, yeah. So, yeah, I will also sit here while you're talking. <laughs> Sorry, I I, uh, I changed the setting of uh, uh, intervention, and uh, I uh, sit uh, and uh, thank you, Dubravka, for translation. I speak in Serbo-Croats, and uh, Dubravka translates me. Uh, uh, Istoria voli priče. The history likes stories. To je iskaz Lui Altisera. Istoara do istoa. I ja ću probati da za ovih 20 ili 15 minuta kojih imam na raspolaganju vam ispričam neku priču. So this was a this was a statement by Louis Altisser, and I will try to, in these 15 to 20 minutes, tell you a story. Uh, naime, uh, uh, svaka klasa na nekom nivou organizuje svoje mesto uh, vidljivosti uh, i promocije. So, any, every, cl any class, every class on certain level organizes its own uh, position of uh, visibility and promotion. Uh, klasa koja je 200 godina dominantna i dan danas je dominanta u istoriji Evrope je uh, klasa evropskih građana. The class which is dominating the history of Europe in the last 200 years is the class of European citizens čiju istoriju znamo koja je startovala sa francuskom revolucijom whose history we know and which started with the french bourgeois revolution i koja je uglavnom svoju vidljivost i svoje mesto organizovala oko figure ili ili mesta koju možemo da nazovemo salon and which uh, organized its uh, figure and its uh, itself around the place which we can call a salon. Uh, salona. We know the function of the pre-revolutionary salon. Kroz koje, koje možemo reći organizovao i sproveo revoluciju francusku, buržoasku. Which organized and implemented uh, French bourgeois revolution. Ali postoji jedna istorija salona koja je zapravo inspirisala čitavu nemačku idealističku filozofiju od Kanta do Hegela. But there is also a history of salon which inspired the whole trajectory of the German idealistic philosophy from Kant to Hegel. Da. Mislim da je važno da sada pomenemo dva salona koja su mišljena i to je jedan, jedan je Fichteov, Fichteova ideja salona i Hegelova ideja salona. So it is important here to mention two uh, salons which were thought. This is Fichte's salon and Hegel's salon. Fichteov salon je salon nacije. Fichte's salon of Fichte is the salon of the nation. Fichte izumeo za kontinentalnu Evropu koncept moderne nacije kao univerzalno partikularnosti. 
Fichte invented for contemporary Europe the concept of modern nation as uh, a concept of universal particularity. I ono što ispada iz njegovog salona and what is outside or drops out of his salon je figura jevreja. Is a figure of Jew. Fichte u govorima nemačkoj naciji kaže ne znam šta da radim sa jevrejima. So Fichte in his speeches to German nation says I don't know what to do with Jewish people. Oni kao da imaju neku dru drugu glavu it, it is like as if they have a different head. I jedino što mi pada na pamet je da im preko noći odsečemo te njihove partikularne e, i glave koje, koje ne mogu da se univerzalizuju i da im nasadimo nove univerzalističke glave, kaže Fichte. And Fichte says the only thing that comes to me is to, to comes to my mind is to overnight cut their particularist figure uh, heads which cannot be universalized and put on them on them a different heads which can then be universalized. Uh, međutim za razliku od fikte ovog salona nacije uh, postoji Hegelov salon, to je sel, ha, salon države, državni salon. So but in opposition or in the difference to Fichte's salon of nation there is a Hege, Hegel's salon of of a state. I Naj, najlepši izraz, sama filologija duha je jedna knjiga, salonska knjiga, kako Hegel kaže. And Hegel by himself set, for, for example calls the phenomenology of spirits as a one uh, salon, book for a salon, uh, salon book. Yes. Uh, I, međutim, on najrazvijenija, uh, najrazvijenija koncept Hegelovog salona ili državnog salona je njegova filozofija prava. But the most developed concept of Hegel salon or the salon of a society is uh, so salon of state. Of state, sorry, salon of state is uh, he uh, Hegel's uh, history of law. No, sorry. No. sorry. Philosophy. Philosophy of law. Yeah. I, I negde tamo u 250. paragrafu Hegel kaže da se u modernom društvu in the 250 paragraph Hegel says that in the modern society pojavila se jedna jedna grupa koju bi on nazvao pöbel ološ there is there the, an, an, a, one group appears which he would uh, call pöbel like plebs like uh, but also with the scum like yeah like i koja je produkt modernog sveta, ali s kojom on ne zna stvarno šta, šta da se radi. Mislim, ona ispada iz, iz države, ispada iz građanskog, civil society, ispada iz građanskog društva. Which is a product of this modern state, but falls out of this modern state and he doesn't know what to do with this figure, because for him he cannot find a space for it within the civic, civil, civic society. I kaže da će se odlučna bitka oko toga šta raditi sa Ološem voditi u budućnosti da on ne može da predvidi šta, šta će se desiti s tim. And Hegel also says that there will the crucial battle that will be fought in the future will be what to do with this figure of Plovo problem which we read but he cannot anticipate how this will be resolved. E, to je moment koji dakle pojavljuje se nešto što je ološ, dakle nešto što je ispalo iz sveta civilnog društva i što je sve dominantnije i masovnije. I was told I'm not in the, okay. in the, in the frame so that I have to. So, but uh, I, was, I was performing the exclusion of the salon. <laughs> Can you please možete pomoći uh, Dakle pojavilo se nešto što je masovno, što je van civilnog društva što ne može da uđe u, u, u njegovo, a, a očigledno da vrši pritisak i postoje neka ekscesna spoljašnjost samog, samog civilnog društva. So, what, what appeared, so it's obvious that something that is mass, that, that there, there is an appearance of something that is mass, massive, uh, but which is outside of this system of civic society, but puts pressure on this system and it's kind of an ex excessive pressure, which is Excessna spoljašnjost. And, and so it's ex, ex, excess, ex, excess exteriority of that system. I 
tu se naravno pojavljaju Marksi koji je ovaj u u u, u Ološu, u Pebelu prepoznao ono što što je što je zapravo radnik, figura radnika, radnička klasa. So Marx appears and he recognizes in this figure of scum Paul uh, uh, actually the figure of a working class of a worker and the figure of a working class for this as you sub. Da je i pomaže da se u tom momentu working class organizuje. And he helps u stvari priključuje se organizacionim modelima subjektivacije radnika u tom momentu, ne organizuje on. So, so he helps and he actually he joins the the moments of organizi of the of the work of the working workers organizing themselves into the subject of a working class. I to je mnoštvo radničkih društava u tom momentu. Dakle radničko društvo je nova novo mesto ili novo mesto radničko društvo. So Nasuprot salonu imamo sada radničko društvo. Radničko društvo, to oni... Kao asocijacija, radnička društva. So, uh, so, and so what, but what, how this uh, working class is being organized is there is like in opposition to a salon there is a workers association work like a work 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 working cl workers club workers organization units that appear i mark san kaže ja sam samo jedan od članova radničkog društva jedno, jedno ja imam jedno radničko društvo nema druge druge ideje and mark kako treba da se organizuje and mark by himself says that u, i'm u njegovoj aktualnosti ne u njegovoj teoriji yeah. So in Marx's actuality, not in his theory, says I'm uh, I'm uh, just one of the members of a working group, working uh, wor workers Associate. associations, uh, and nothing more. U intervju koje je dao novinaru New York Times va 71. u vreme Pariske komune kada tako da kažem pokus grad Buržoa građanska e, policija pokušava da identifikuje šta se to dešava i kako je moguća pariska komuna, ko to organizuje, ko to stoji iza njega, iza, e, iza pariske komune. Ona pravi intervju sa Marksom, gde Marks ovaj, kaže. So in, the, in 1871, in the moment of uh, Paris commune, Marx is interviewed by the New York Times. Uh, Uh, which was this which was actually bourgeois Bur Bur police trying to understand and explain itself where is where where is as this pa paris commune comes from what's the origin of this ko to organizuje in who organizes this i direktno optužuje novinaru razgovoru marksa da on stoji za toga and the, the new journalist who is interviewing marx accuses marx that he is the one who is behind this organizing and instigating paris commune i Marx sad kaže, pa jedino očigledno što buržazija ne može da shvati ili građani ne može da shvati da su radnici potpuno autonomni i da misle i da mogu da se organizuju. To je najveći skandal, očigledno. Ja ne stojim iza ovoga, ja sam samo jedan od članova radničkog društva. And, but, Mar but Marx responds that obviously the most uh, uncomprehensible thing for, for a bourgeois society and you know, for a Uh, citizenry is that uh, working class and the worker can organize by themselves that they don't that they don't need to be organized from someone who is from member of bourgeois bourgeoisie i to je važno zato što marx nema ideju o uh, radničkoj partiji nema ideju o komunističkoj partiji nema ideju uopšte o tome da radnici treba da se organizuju i da se subjektiviraju kroz partiju And this is important because Marx does not have an idea of a workers or a communist party or idea that uh, uh, that uh, that the workers will subjectivize themselves through the party. Za Marxa je ceo politički sistem još od 
jevrijsko pitanje, 48. zapravo čitava sfera politike, sfera koju organizuje građanstvo i radnici nemaju šta da traže u sferi politike. For Marx, ever since the Jewish question in 1848, the sphere of politics is the sphere of bourgeoisie and that there is no space for workers. I sama, I sama ideja partije je jedna od, tako da kažem, mehanizama produkcije uh, privatne svojine zapravo. And in that line, the, the very idea of the party is a mechanism of production of private property. I uopšte čitava svet politike, parlamentarne, demokratske i tako dalje. Tako da Marx nema ideju partije, Mar Marx nema veze sa komunističkim partijama, ovo što retroaktivno Marxu prišivaju. <laughs> On je napisao komunistički manifest, ali nije nikada participirao u ideju partije, I niti je mislio da radništvo treba da se organizuje u partije. Uh, so, and this is also that Marx also sees the, the kind of the whole parliamentary system also invested within the, in this idea of private property and he never uh, theorized or thought uh, party as a one was a way of organizing of the workers and, uh, and as also that it is a way to uh, uh, think further. Da. Uh, ideja da radnici imaju veze s partijom je došla tek sa drugom internacionalnom intervencijom Engelsa, zapravo političkom intervencijom Engelsa koji je a, čitav svet, da ga kažem, borbi radničkih prišio za opet ideju Francuske revolucije a, i za dan, da ga kažem, osnivanja internacionale druge uzove pad Bastilje što je vratilo u imaginari, da ga kažem, buržarske politike. The idea of the party comes with Engels who at the second who actually introduces this idea during an makes an intervention on the second international which also he connects to well brings back the reference to the French Revolution because the the day of founding of second international was the, was chosen to be the the fall of Bastille so there it's kind of he is the one who makes this conceptual connection and imaginary connection to the French bourgeois revolution Da, i tada je počela da se uspostavlja veza između socijaldemokratskih partija u gravnom i radništva, što nije bila Marksova ideja. And that, that was the moment when the, the relationship between social democratic party and workers, workers started to appear, which was not Marks idea. Uh, I ono što postaje, tako da kažem, leninistički moment u ovom je to da sam Lenin prepoznaje da je, dolazi jedna epoha nova, a to je to je veza države i partije zapravo. And uh, after which we can detect a Len Leninist moment in this in this sequence when Lenin uh, realizes that there is a new epoch coming which is an epoch in which there is a connection between a party and the state. Drugim rečima država i partija su jedna te ista stvar. Uh, or that the party and the state are, are one one the same thing. I u tom leninističkom momentu imamo pre toga jedan moment nakon uh, Pariske komune i njene propasti, imamo drugi moment propad, propast radničke revolucije u Nemačkoj ili koja je bila originalno radnič, pokušaj radničke revolucije. So and so in this Leninist moment we uh, we, ca we can also from that uh, see the second important moment next to the s tim imamo propast radnik pokušaja radnika koji su organizovali revoluciju i propali u is Nemačkoj. Is the the moment of a, of a, of a failure of the workers revolution in Ge Ge Germany together with the kind of failure kind of the failure of the workers who were trying to organize. Dakle, imamo moment sada propasti jednog radničke revolucije i uspona uh, revolucije koja dolazi sa sovjetskim momentom. So we have a failure of a workers revolution and, and the rise of a revolution again which comes with a soviet moment koji je isključivo sekvenca partije, ali ne 
Radnika. Which is uh, the which is connected to the sequence of the party and not to the worker. I ono što je važno već 23. godine sovjetski teoretičari prava kada pokušavaju da razumeju kako treba da izgleda pravni sistem Sovjetskog saveza mislim na Pašukanice i na drugove So and that what is important is that already in 1923 when the Soviet Soviet law theoreticians Pašukanice and others uh, when they are trying to understand the formation of the state of the socialist state kažu kako da zasnujemo kako da zasnujemo pravo socijalističko kada naše istraživanja pokazuju da je pravo samo holofraziranje forme privatnog vlasništva i ono što mi nemamo u ovom momentu to je novi tip vlasništva jednostavno u momentu u pokušaju razvoja socijalističke države u kome nema novog tipa vlasništva mi ćemo za deset godina doživjeti propast revolucije tad još 23. godine to detektivno So in 1923 they say okay how can we form and, and how we conceal also law in a socialist country if we are if we stay with the because law if if we understand that law is just a ventriloquist for the property and property. from the pri for the private property and that in order to properly conceive socialist state we we need to rethink the concept of property as such new type new type, new type of properties uh, otherwise the socialist state in the long run is doomed paralelno u, u istoriji evrope pojavlja se fenomen pojavlja se fenomen nacionalnog socijalizma in parallel to this trajectory there is a phenomenon so the phenomenon of national socialism appears koji je na neki način pokušaj ujedinjenja dve revolucije francuske francuske nacionalne i sovjetske socijalističke to je neki pokušaj which is in a way a, 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 a attempt to join two revolutions ne, the french uh, national revolution and soviet work, work social re, social, revolution. social revolution i dobijemo taj ekskluzivni ovaj spoj nacionalnog i so, e, socijalističkog pod dominacijom partije dakle partije države ekstremno partije države so and so we get this exclusive uh, joining of uh, national and social under the auspices of party which equals state i ono što je zapravo uh, se dešava pod nacionalnom socijalističkom revolucijom to je uh, apsolutna privatizacija uh, ili privatizacija koja teče od 33. do 45. i nacionalni socijalizam za razliku od fašizma je proces privatizacije fašizam je proces nacionalizacije u korist fašističke države a ovdje imamo razlika u tome što je ovo apsolutna privatizacija dakle so what, what is happening with the national socialist revolution is an absolute privatization in which runs from 1933 to 1945 and national socialism for in a difference to fascism which is nationalization in the in for the purpose of social of, of, of fascist state mm -hmm. of fascist state national socialism is absolute privatization drugim uh, rečima logor je samo jedan logor nacistički je samo jedan momena tu procesu privatizacije. In other words, concentration camp is one moment in this process of privatization. Uh, 
i ono što se ne događa nakon 45. u procesu denacifikacije, to je nacionalizacija i traženje nekog drugog oblika onog što je nacionalno-socijalistička država privatizovala od 1933. do 1945. godine. So what, and what happens after 1945 in, when the process of denazification starts is not rethinking of this process of privatization. No rethinking, uh, nationalization. Nation, nationaliza <laughs> sorry, national, nationalization. And, thi and uh, so what happens after in the anti, the, uh, sorry. What happens in the process after 1945 and uh, denazification is not that the nationalization does not happen, and uh, and, uh, and and the figure of pri privatization is not challenged. And in the structure of privatization, uh, structure of property and the pri uh, effects of privatization, nothing is challenged. Everything stays the same. Sve familije koje su vodile Siemensa i druge koje su nastale kroz proces privatizacije Weimarskog, da kažem, Weimarske države i njene eluzivne, eluzivnog odnosa vlasništva u kome apsolutna privatizacija još nije uzela maha, ostaje tako, do dan danas je tako. So all the, for example, all, for example, all the big families which uh, started to gather their property already through the Weimar Republic where, where this dominance of pro private property was not so obvious, continued on to own and be owners after 1945 and after the, the, the war until today. Dakle, nema, nismo imali therefore, therefore, the process of denazification did not really happen. Uh, Ono što sad, mi živimo sada u jednoj sekvenci nakon uh, jednog kratkog perioda podruštjavanja, uh, kako da kažem, podružavanja privatnog vlasništva ili nekog minimalnog koje je trajalo od 45. do, do 80. godine, mi sad živimo u epohi apsolutne privatizacije. So. So now we are again living in the, the, pro, the, in the epoch of absolute privatization because there was, a, between 1945 and 1980, there was a tendency to, uh, to, to socialize certain aspects of property relations. Private, private of property. Private property. Uh, ali ono što je, tako kažem, kao jedna mala sekvenca u istoriji Evrope, to je zapravo slučaj Jugoslovenske revolucije koji je ostao sakriven. But there is a hidden moment in the sequence of this uh, of this history that uh, that it's a, it's a it's a moment of Yugoslav revolution. Čiji je rezultat bila društvena svojina. Who, which resulted in in the concept of societal property. Dakle, od 41. do 52. traje Jugoslovenska revolucija koja ima razne sekvence, ali rezultat je društvena svojina. Between 1941 till 1952, Jugoslav revolution is taking place, place and it has a different trajectory during this period of time, sequences, but uh, what is crucial, what, what the crucial outcome of this is the concept of societal property. I društvena svojina je jedna neosvetljena kategorija koja bi dan danas nije kako kažem van, van, nije poznata jednostavno, ona je neprepoznata. Societal property is one is still little known or almost not recognized phenomenon and appearance. Ali je ono što je važno da je jugoslovenska revolucija Jugoslovenska revolucija kroz rezultat društvene svojine uspela da po prvi put u istoriji stvori društvo, radničko društvo, koje nema veze sa, tako da kažem, dosadašnjim oblicima civil society koje u stvari dominantno društvo vlasnika i pod hegemonijom društva, 
društva vlast. Prvi put u istoriji je stvoreno radničko društvo. But what Yugoslav Revolution managed to do through the pro concept of societal property is for the first time to form a society of workers and not a, not a civil society which recognizes workers as its part. Kao društvo vlasnika. As a, as, as a, own, a society of owners. Definicija društvenog vlasnika je da društveno vlasnik ne posjeduje niko. The definition uh, of societal property is that it's not that, that it's a property that is non that is not owned by any any entity recognized as, as an individual yeah. with a name or a surname nor a group of a uh, group of people with their names and surnames. The to je vlasništvo bez titulara. It's a it's a property without a it's a concept of property without a Drugim rečima, ono može da se koristi, a ne može da se posjeduje. I to je jedino mesto kada je proizvedeno društvo. Tako da, ono ono što je bio zapravo odgovor Jugoslovenske revolucije, to je politički odgovor na epohu apsolutne privatizacije. So, Jugoslav revolution is a political response to the epoch of uh, absolute privatization. Nacional socijalizma. Of national socialism. I rezultat te borbe je zapravo otkriće društvenog vlasništva. And as a result of that uh, struggle was uh, conceptualization of societal property. Tako da ono što sada u našoj aktualnosti koja opet postaje aktualnost apsolutne privatizacije je na novo otkrivanje koncepta društvene svojine. In our actuality of absolute privatization we are actually coming to the moment in which of a rediscovery of a societal property. I ja mislim da je to jedini mogući odgovor na barbarizam našeg doba. And I think that this is the only possible answer to the barbarianism of contemporary moment. Hvala. Thank you. Thank you, Branimir. Very much for this uh, talk, and I would love to invite Jan. Brenna, please join us. No, I would maybe you should sit here. I can sit here. Um, so let us just do Bravka. Thank you so much. I know it was hard now to do this, and you have done this really. Amazingly, like bravely and amazingly. Um, okay, I would like first to ask if are there some questions uh, to the audience, from the audience, and we can then think, you know, what kind of other property propositions did we, you know, hear from, from both talks that we can now think about and also um, in a way uh, that, which is really interesting that um, these properties are actually based on those that are rejected, invisible concepts, or those who look at the first glance like failures. Uh, and actually mm, the question is, should the category of property uh, let's say, mm, be completely rejected. Can this be like kind of a proposition uh, which lead then to realization of different relations of belonging in this, in this sense? And which kind of relationship could emerge out of this? I mean, this would be more my question to both of you. Hmm? Yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, Dubrovka. 
I'm, I'm, I'm also not so happy to, uh, you know. Uh, so, so yes, um, and and at the same time, I would like really the audience, if you if you if you have questions, to to come up with this. Okay, I will keep this my question, uh, our question in mind, and I'm. Yeah, I would also like to uh, to to kind of join to our question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't think that uh, the joining to, you know, like our is a form of uh, privatization. We also had uh, this kind of uh, organizations of united labor in Yugoslavia, which are precisely written as our, mm. our, our. So this is uh, uh, s just to just to uh, maybe add uh, one like little. Mm, uh, mm, I, I cannot find the word, but uh, but uh, but one little uh, moment in the sequence uh, of uh, actually uh, Dubravka's and your question and our question, uh, which is uh, the moment uh, uh, of debating the Commons today, uh, as a sort of uh, as a sort of maybe prolonged meaning of the social property. Uh, but also within uh, the neoliberal uh, neoliberal conditions. Uh, I hope this does not disturb the uh, 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 yeah the the field of uh, the question of ours. Uh, Comments is uh, only the for me the uh, one uh, uh, form of private property. Commons is uh, you have uh, different people, individual, like a collective. Mm -hmm. Collective uh, property is a private property. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so yeah, no, I just said I don't entirely agree. With the, I, I think you can have forms of collectivity and collective use uh, that don't look like or operate like a private form of property. But the, I think what I wanted to say in response to the collective question that was posed, um, I guess two things come to mind. I think any time you're dealing with a legal form, so if we're thinking about property in relationship to law, um, I think that we inevitably end up in a position in a contradictory and sort of ambiguous position of on the one hand, thinking of ways maybe a kind of property abolition, property abolitionism, let's say. And, um, and that might involve not using the word property and <laughs> trying to really force ourselves to think about um, collective forms of use rather than ownership, just trying to really push ourselves out of an ownership paradigm. And I think you know, as you, as you pointed out, Melitza, that also starts with how we, it starts very much with our own consciousness and subjectivity, et cetera, and how we relate to one another. Um, but I, I also think at the same time that in, in trying to undo or dismantle uh, privatization, forms of individual private ownership, or, you know, et cetera, any forms of private ownership, really, um, you know, one is, is within different legal systems that uh, contradict forms of private property ownership. There's tons of examples all around us. So, you know, uh, on the one hand, we, I mean, I think it's more a matter of pushing in all of these directions, you know. And um, I think there's, the, the point about the commons is really interesting because in thinking about indigenous um, and First Nations resistance to land dispossession, uh, resource extraction, um, and and indigenous sovereignty movements. Let's say um, there is, you know, there are. I'm, I I grew up in Canada, and some of my research is still based there. So, you know, I would say there are are a plethora of different First Nations who have um, understandings of human relationships land. And um, and things that we call resources like water uh, that are very much uh, you know originating outside of a 
of course, of a capitalist you know, framework in consciousness or a framework of individual private property. It is interesting to think about that in relationship to some of the work on the commons that has emerged out of different contexts. Um, I think sometimes when the language of the commons is used in contexts where there are also First Nations and Indigenous um, social movements, mobilizations, sovereignty movements, then we can be critical, in fact, of this kind of, some, some of the fantasy of the commons that's present in some of the work on the commons, which ignores uh, colonial history. Um, at the same time, I wouldn't want to, uh, I, I would like to think in parallel or think together about you know, First Nations and indigenous um, movements to reclaim land and to think about that in relationship to how the commons is being theorized by some private law scholars and others um, to fight back against neoliberal forms of privatization and extraction in, in you know, Italian cities, for instance, is one place where a lot of this work is being done and, and also in some Latin American contexts. So, I think it's really important to, in, in trying to think against and outside of regimes of private property ownership to, you know, with, with an anti-colonial, anti-racist framework at the forefront to think, think these different kinds of resistance together or in the same frame. Yeah, also as a form of praxis, practice, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, uh, I would later go to Branimir to, to maybe explain more about the commons that you say maybe you can also translate that this goes more in deep, that we understand what stands behind this. But at the same, I wanted to ask, maybe we can also talk about this later because we will have some interviews that we'll record. But you also mentioned uh, actually the concept of memorialization that actually goes about reparation and abolition that you mentioned now. But what would you like to s say some few words about this? Mm, How you bring this in connection with the, the concept of discovery? Yeah, I was, just, I was thinking about it because the other day we had um, a workshop in London that which involved three different, schol well, two scholars and an artist. And one of the scholars, Anita Ruprecht, who works with someone named Catherine Bergen, has been doing work on uh, kind of critical work on reparations. Um, and they, I think, contrary to um, some reparations movements that see reparation as a way of kind of solving past injustice, uh, actually are, are framing the idea, of, and of course Anita and Catherine are not the only ones, they're part of, you know, along uh, a, a big group of scholars doing this, but. Um, they want to reframe the idea of reparation as, as a kind of mode of inquiry that requires us to not only investigate the history of, let's say, slavery in, in, her, in the example of her work, uh, but to understand very much how um, that history is, shapes are present, of course, um, but in ways that don't, where, where the demand for reparation doesn't close off that, that history as something that can ever be, uh, you know, sort of reconciled. So, or, or, or you know, there's not, there's not a, a calculable debt that can be repaid. Um, and so it turns into a very different kind of um, concept of time, a very different concept of history and a, a very different set of political demands. So that's, that's what, you know, the resonances with the way you were talking about memorialization that I think are really interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have a question if I may, okay. before you. Okay. So, but uh, building on all this, for me what is really interesting with this all, like I'll sum, I think this is in important, like a lot of reparations discourse, or some of reparations discourse, see this as a w as a memor me as a way of certain uh, of African American populations in the U.S. to get enough capital in order to recover the lack of. Uh, so it so it is so, so with 
st which is a lot, which we st which is staying within this inf enclosure of capitalist subjectivity, which wa wantingly or unwantingly, even those of us who grew up in Yugoslavia, we were still kind of subjectivized through. So, so, and what you are saying, and I think some of the things that we, we've been talking about when we think about this investigative memorialization and the whole, and understanding this continuity, is also how do we have imaginary which goes beyond, understanding that it's not about resolving things, that there is no reconciliation, but that, that, all, that also means different subjectivity that goes beyond capitalist subjectivity and imagination, because I have a feeling that our imagination is also privatized. That's a really good question, and if I can just answer briefly. <laughs> um, sure. there's, a, there's a very good chapter in Robin Kelly's book, Freedom Dreams, on reparations, and he actually um, charts a lot of the older movements for reparations in the aftermath of the end of slavery, but he charts the continuation of movements for reparations um, after World War II. Um, some of s some of these movements for reparations um, actually referred to the reparations that were happening in in the European context as a as a as a way of bolstering their arguments. But what he says, which I think is crucial, is that most of these movements for reparations were not about um, individual payment, and they were not about trying to actually calculate you know, what, what was owed, and it, because there's the, this, you know, the, the harms of slavery can never really be uh, put into, a, um, into some kind of economic value. But what the reparations movements, a lot of them were for, were for um, land and for resources so that um, black communities and other communities could, could um, organize themselves to live autonomously. So, it, you know, I mean, the Black Panthers had a claim for reparation, to just use that as an example. So, you know, it, it, is, a, it is a political demand that I think is, is made with a, a very anti-capitalist, a much broader political horizon before it. So I don't think that reparations demands necessarily, especially in that context, uh, fall into, or they're not kind of captured, I guess, by a capitalist imaginary. But in that, just to I think this is interesting to think with, for example, what Brenton was mentioning at, at his presentation, the fact that how the more, the, that the fact that there are almost no living protagonists anymore, ne no more people who were forced as slave laborers in affluence, in a way reduces the demand to the acknowledge this because of these reparations that were coming after for, of being forced la laborer. But that somehow then in looking into these types of, thinking about these types of reparations, which don't aim at recognition of personal labor, which was, which was, uh, which was taken in order to build uh, something, and, and, and then saying, okay, we, although there are no any more living people, we can still claim reparations in order to open this anti-capitalist, anti-Nazi horizon and anti-racial. Yeah, maybe Branimir, back to you, and if you can explain now this relation yeah, to... Uh, so obično kad se kaže... Uh, okay, so uh, let's just switch my... You know, switch your head. Switch my head. Obično kad se kaže privatno vlasništvo, svi podrazumijemo da je to individualno privatno vlasništvo. So usually when we say, when somebody says private property, it is, re it is uh, considered that it is a private individual property. Međutim, privatno vlasništvo ima jako puno lice. Postoji javno, javno vlasti, mislim, javno dobro koje je zapravo oblik privatno vlasti ili državno vlasti, što je opet oblik privatno vlasti. Sve su to oblici i jednog te isto privatno vlasti. Društveno vlasti se baš u tome razlikuje, što nije individualno, privatno, nije javno i nije državno. Znači ima četvrti oblik vlasti. Koji nije u režimu privatnog vlasništva. I komen po meni spada u jedan od oblika privatnog vlasništva. Uh, so, uh, so, so, private property has many different faces, and many so, uh, so public or state property are still in the regime of private property. 
what is the difference public also pu and public uh, this is the form of uh, private property so it, these are all forms of private uh, property and that a societal property was was in that context like a fort or not you are actually completely outside of this thinking that there is certain group to which certain definable group to which zato što je to nedeljivo vlastištvo i ne može se deliti niti onda iz toga proizilazi jedan drugi tip subjektivnosti koji nije više individualna subjektivnost građanina. And this is because uh, i, uh, this, uh, the, this societal property is imposed, it's undividable, undividable, you can't break it into a smaller pieces of proper, pro property and out of that a different type of sub subjectivity appears the appe subjectivity which is not based on the individual subjectivation uh, drugim rečima uh, subjekt uh, član društva pod hegemonijom društvenog vlasništva nije isto što i građanin to je potpuno on je potpuno dru drugi tip subjektivnosti on je ne, zapravo neko mnoštvo u sebi nema nikakvu subjektivnost koju individualnu subjektivnost koju podrazumeva privatno vlasništvo na njemu izašlo izraslo pravo neće moći privesti so uh, the mem because the member of a society, society which comes out of thinking of societal property is not is not a citizen, is not this individual subjectivity of a citizen, but it's some kind of a multi multi multitude subjectivity. Pa, sub, on jednostavno, zato što društveno vlastništvo nema titulara, otvara se pitanje e, subjekta bez imena zapravo. Because the societal property does not have this title holder, You, the, what opens up is the question is who is this subject in the space of ne, the... Otvara se pitanje subjekta bez imena. Sub, yeah, it's a, so the, it's the opening of the question of who, who, what is the subject without a name. This is a crucial question. What is the subject without name? The name is the center of private property. You must have seen to approve this is mine. so his the part the crucial paradigm of his of his uh, poetry is how to continue without oneself and social properties give this kind of horizon of other type of su subjectivation and for me the first object of postmodern uh, society is the social property this is some kind of new type of subjectivation uh, and uh, for me the modernism and the uh, 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 epoch of prosthetic enlightenment is a some kind of last defined of concept of private property with the social property we have the new object in history totally new object who produce some new type of identity the society who uh, belong the uh, uh, social property some kind uh, doesn't have uh, the uh, point of granite doesn't have exterior border exterior border society is of some kind horizontality only intervention of state law produce 
this kind of subjectivation and this this kind of um, uh, intervention of state and horizontality of uh, the society who in a hegemony of social properties doesn't have any uh, spoiling right. Uh, so, 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 the, so, does, so in the hegemony, it doesn't have this exterior border so that there is like the to. state, the, the this comes also with, um, like this Sorry, yeah. I think Brenna yeah. wanted to ask oh, yeah, a I question. I just wanted to ask a question about uh, societal property, which, I mean, the idea of not having a property, a title holder, and, and that sounds pretty amazing, and I would like to find out more about it. I guess my question has to do with, when we're thinking about praxis, um, I, think, I think there's a difference between thinking about abstract forms and abstract legal forms and, and then how people actually negotiate property and relations of use in a day-to-day -day way. So we could say that in this asphyxiating sort of, you know, regime of neoliberalism and private property ownership that's, you know, killing cities and killing people and, and all of that, that, um, you know, there are still ways in which people uh, create ways of living and also ways of surviving this this world that are uh, that are counter to to kind of private property norms, let's say, or or norms of individual ownership. And so, I guess conversely, I, I would ask, I would wonder about how the societal property actually functioned, you know, in 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 the time that it did, or you know, you can have very collective forms, but then, y well. you know, w we th well, I, we think about gender, and we think about, you know, patriarchy, and I think about racism, and I, having been a part of many groups over the years that aim to be collective, uh, I'm, I'm also quite wary of how uh, these abstract forms can often just turn into, you know, um, uh, a mess of kind of, uh, you know, destructive relations of power and hierarchies. So sure. um, I think, I, I think you know, um, I'm really interested in the, in these, in talking about different forms of use and um, societal property, commons, and those kinds of things. But I also think, as a part of that conversation, it's important to, to think at a more kind of granular level about what they actually look like or maybe what they look like historically. Uh, uh, I don't know, just, just before you answer, we can maybe have one small question from the audience. Yeah, you will have, yeah. But Branimir, please answer, yeah. Uh, and then uh, we'll yeah. have Ko, ko govori, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, društveno vlačstvo je funkcionisalo u Jugoslaviji kao centralni, centralni da, da kažem, uh, centralni deo jugoslovenskog ustava je zapravo uh, deo koji je posjećen društvenoj svojini kao ključnom dostignuću jugoslovenske revolucije. I to nije nikakva fikcija bilo. So, societal property was not a f fiction in the sense that it was a crucial part of Yugoslav constitution that was uh, that was written not after but actually during the Second World War. And, so and, and, and it was the kind of crucial category which was through which the thinking of organizing of everyday relations where it was thought and practiced. Tako da nije nikakva abstraktna forma kao što ona misli. Yeah, but it, so, so, it, so it, it, it moved from being abstract, it was not just an abstract form, it was also, there were, it was also attempted to be practiced within this. Uh, ono što je, ono, ono što je zapravo uh, napad na društvenu svojinu je bio iz polja iznutra, nije, ono je nestalo upravo u krvavom ratu da. 90. I od, jedini razlog, tako kažem, ratova je bilo kako privatizovati društvenu svojinu. 
To je razlog, ne zato što su se mrzeli Srbi, Hrvati, Slovenci i drugi narodi, nego kako privatizovaci društvene svojine. So, so, and actually, so, but this, this, uh, this societal property was uh, attacked both from inside and outside. Because, you know, Yugoslavia was like, you know, it, although it had some adding a little bit, of, Yugoslavia had this concept that state should wither away. And that with time, the state will disappear and that this self-managed individuals will in organizing themselves themselves in this basic association of organized labor so that people will associate their labor and through to nisam their rekao, in, I, no 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 but i'm giving context that people actually understand so sorry to, to je pogrešan kontekst ne zanima me samo upravljanje ne, uopšte ne, ne, okay, to nije bitna ali, to nije bitno pitanje ali mo, da bi objasnili unutrašnji ne voj ti da objašnjavaš ono što ja govorim ako možeš me prevodi, ako ne, ja ću se potruditi da govorim na engleskom i to je to. Ne, okej, ali sam htjela da im objasnim da ljudi razumeju u dinamiku... Ne želim da razumeju iz perspektive samoupravljanja koje je nebitno. Sorry. Okej, no, sorry. So, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go back. So, basically, there was an exterior and interior pressure on societal property as a concept. And within... No concept, reality. Or as a practice, as a practice. And within the and, ac and actually it got kind of dis it disappeared in war, and that there was no actually the war of Yugoslavia in Yugoslavia was it it needed to happen in order for privatization of societal property to this take place. This is a war for privatization. Be this is not uh, for um, hate between Serb and Croat and Muslim. This is a stupid thing. This is how privatize the social property. Mm -hmm. This is the war. This is the reason of the war in Yugoslavia. Uh, and uh, the problem is, I think that in actuality we have a possibility to produce the social property. Uh, svaka firma koja nastaje, nastaje od kapitala rada i kapitala, investicijonog kapitala. So, so that in uh, actuality, then I, so today in actuality we also, also have a kind of ways of thinking this societal property or, or practicing this societal property because every every company that is being enterprise that is being formed it has capital of work of labor and capital of investment pitanje zašto se kapital investitora računa ovaj a da se kapital rada nema pravo na upravljanje mada je identičan uvek u ulaganje ne može to the question yes so the question arises why the capital capital of labor is not recognized as the one that also opens up, a, 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 like has a, a should be recognized as a managerial as well. This is the same and as the well, uh, capital of work and capital of investment. This is the capital, but only to have possibility to manage is the capital of investment, <laughs> not capital of work. But this is a stupid. Uh, uh, I think this is the, the, the future of our time that recognize that is a capital of work is the apple in the right to manage like a capital of investment. It's a very simple idea. And the, in, a, in the, our reality, uh, we don't have to transpose the question why is this stupid situation possible. Okay, that's a huge responsibility. But <laughs> thanks very much, first of all, to you both for these uh, thought-provoking um, uh, um, um, presentations. Okay, um, this question. This is a question that's primarily inspired by uh, Bre uh, Brenner's presentation, but I'll try and relate it to Branimir's as well. So um, I was absolutely you know, fascinated by this uh, problematiz problematization of uh, the relationship between land and labor. And I'm wondering if, if there's something there that uh, actually um, is the real question that uh, kind of determines the way in which we uh, kind of do away with private property and this kind of imaginary of belonging that's kind of um, confined to private property. So um, I, I was thinking about uh, when you talked about the figure of um, uh, um, the vagabond um, I was thinking about um, some, uh, you know, certain societies that, um, or communities uh, that that um, come from contexts that I'm more familiar with, 
um, such as the you know the nomadic communities of you know the Bedouins and um, the the Kochars in Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm which um, they may be nomadic, but but there's definitely a sense of structure and order, and there's definitely I mean we, we may not want to call it property, but there's a definitely a sense of civilization and uh, as in settledness. Um, it's just happening on a larger scale, if you want. Um, and there's a, a definitely a sense of order to the way in which uh, these communities move and how they actually build also things. So um, I was wondering if, yeah, if there's, the, there's a way of rethinking uh, the relationship between labor and land, uh, not so much as one in which you know, land becomes, sorry, labor becomes abstracted to kind of assign value to land, but actually uh, it's the kind of mechanism that, um, yeah, uh, kind of underpins the sense of belonging, um, as in um, kind of the, both the belonging of the land to people and the people to, to the land um, itself. And I'm wondering if taking this to um, 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 Vladimir's um, um, talk, um, again, I, 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 I wonder how, again, the specifics of this societal uh, property worked. Um, was it a, a, a kind of case where you had, you know, you gave so much to simplify things uh, of your labor to society and there's that value that's again abstracted, which then makes you part of that society, and therefore one of the kind of or members of that kind of collective that owns societal property. Or was labor a, a kind of mechanism really where you really kind of uh, put labor into a certain place, geography, a land, and then that's how you actually became part of this idea of uh, the community that owns this uh, societal uh, property. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, yeah, that's a very good question uh, and comment. Um, one of the chapters in my book is actually focused on a case study of the Bedouin. And um, I look at a lot of the legal cases uh, where um, the Bedouin uh, communities, families making legal claims to uh, regain their lands um, for land restitution. Um, are forced to show evidence of cultivation because cultivation is the remains to this day kind of the key uh, rationale for dispossessing indigenous peoples of their land. You know, you did not cultivate the land according to a very narrow conception of cultivation. I mean, you know, if it's not uh, cultivation in a I mean, Israel's a little more complicated because of the history of the kibbutzim, et cetera, but generally, if you're not cultivating the land in the sense of a, of a European or even English mode of agrarian capitalism, you know, in terms of the, the kind of, of uh, uh, cultivation, the way the crops are grown, you know, the way that the, the land is labored, then whatever you're doing on the land does not give rise to an ownership interest. Um, now, in Canada, there's a judgment from the Supreme Court of Canada in 2014 in the Chilcotin case, where the Chilcotin First Nation actually says, no, we have rights to this vast expanse of territory, which is actually still a tiny fraction of their traditional territory, and we're not basing it on this need to show evidence of cultivation. In fact, we have a different concept of, of land use and a different way of you know, traversing over our land. And um, the Supreme Court of Canada in that case actually recognized their, their Aboriginal title. And in doing that, made a kind of step forward. But as I argue in the book, um, it's still caught within the bounds of a, of a racial anthropology because they use the language of semi-nomadic to, to recognize the right. And so, um, I mean, this is, of course, the, the rabbit hole of legal recognition. <laughs> I mean, once you decide to make a claim for legal recognition, then this is, you know, there's going to be a kind of violent closure. But, um, um, but I guess, you know, I think whether we want to call it property or not, these other forms of using land and relating to land are definitely things that we need to learn about and sort of um, learn from, and those are, are two really good examples. Uh, 
Ne, to neko što radi, on ne poseduje ništa. So no, the the fact that someone is laboring does not it it does not own anything or this or. On jedino može da upravlja procesom sa učestvom u upravljanju i odlučuje o o korišćenju ekstra profita, ali ne može da poseduje ništa. And so so that labor. Radnici ne mogu da poseduju. Radnici nisu nisu vlasnici. So workers in that are not owners. So they are uh, the, the kind of the labor. Uh, the labor includes you in a management, in a kind of decision making principle. I labor include labor in includes you into uh, de decisions about distribution and decisions about management. And uh, the, uh, but it's not a, or, but, uh, and, uh, and also how to redistribute the surplus value. So the, so you, so but you are not owning. No, so so kind of the fact Definicija that you are working. Definition is that no one owns. And then I think, uh, can, 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 Okay, uh, so I think we're, uh, 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 yeah, but we have to start a break, but if you have like a great small question. <laughs> now with this kind of um, uh, in introduction of having great thought. Now just, uh, I was thinking of, um, in the sense of that we maybe talk about things coming from the different dimensions and this idea of you know the 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 word of the word property even like having private property of the collective for any kind of property it, it's it's coming from the system that something involves um involves transaction of that property that the property can be given to someone and in in the idea of which i think it's much closer to the maybe indigenous nation of like the usage of a land it's like there is no property because you can't own it. And m maybe in this two, it's how I perceive it as, I don't know, two, two dimensions or two approaches to the land. And that in one that we can only have maybe certain amount of rules or, or laws or negotiation on the usage of the land. But then again, is the problem when you have some other coming and what it does is that it colonizes the land and kind of applies different set of rules. And that in these two systems, I don't know, it was just a thought, maybe how to, you know, how to think of the possible new kind of thinking and using the planet in general and how we can negotiate in between us what to do with it. Okay, so do you want to answer to this? I, I just wanted to say, yeah, I mean, I think I think this this the terrain that we're talking about and that we're covering is really complex. And I think it's I just want to make clear, I think it's really important not to generalize about indigenous ways of relating to land that don't involve ownership. I mean, First Nations are fighting in many different places for recognition of their ownership of their land. And I think it's it's very, I mean, my, my own view is that I would not, uh, you know, sort of declare in response to those struggles that any labor, for instance, that you mix with, with land doesn't give rise to an ownership right. I mean, there's ways of conceiving of that outside of a Lockean paradigm that are really important. And I think that you know, there's, there's a huge amount of complexity involved in struggles over ownership when we think about racial dispossession. And so we, you know, I, I, I think it's quite impossible to, to make really kind of universal sort of declarations about what is right and what is wrong and what's good ownership and what is bad ownership and, and all of that. I mean, trust me, I'm completely invested in, in thinking about how to dismantle private property ownership. But if we take into account the histories of slavery and colonialism, this complicates the picture vastly. Um, and so, 
you know, I, I think it's, it's difficult, I guess, to, to, to think of a model, I think, if we, if we really think seriously about racism. It's, it's very difficult to, s to think of one model that we can kind of adhere to unproblematically. And I think, you know, it, it's, that's why this kind of conversation or, or this work, this kind of investigation, always needs to be rooted in, in a kind of specific context that, that is, is cognizant of its complexity and also its limits. Thank you, Brenna, very much.